Let's go on to your campaign uh, that you've recently run. Let's shirt talk. Hashtag yeah. let's shirt talk about raising awareness of uh, of mental health in football, encouraging people who are struggling with mental health to, in football as sportsmen to speak up and talk you know and you did this by auctioning off uh some rather famous shirts some pretty impressive yes. ones including a team gb shirt i do believe right ryan Giggs. ryan Giggs. so um how'd that go uh, how much did you raise and uh um i can't remember the figure off the top of my head now it was a couple of thousand it was a raffle so the tickets yeah, were yeah. five pound each yeah um we wanted to do it I, well i wanted to do it that way yeah. um because i wanted it to be as accessible as possible and as opposed to an auction where you might get 15 wealthy people yeah. who might bid for the shirts. Yeah, yeah keep it. Equal. This way you get a lot of people and then that way as well, you, you get to spread the message of mental health and awareness much further than yeah, rather than just keeping it in a very close bubble. Yeah, the last thing you want is it for, for it to become like a rich person's uh, plaything, really, because I mean, like yeah. football, you want it to be available for, yeah. for everyone. Um, and they were my shirts as well, so you know, I, I I wanted them to go to. I didn't want them just to go to you know, the collectors or whatever, person. right? I wanted them to go to good homes. Yeah, did, did, and did, were you happy with uh, which which shirt was the most popular? Which, I mean, obviously they were raffle. Which shirt was the most popular? Which shirt sold the most? Uh, the most. No, so it was just it was um, just they were all in together. Oh, for okay, a raffle, right, so right. It was just oh, one right. of my. I'd probably say the most popular. I I don't know, but yeah, I would yeah. guess it would would have been Ryan Giggs. Really? What was your favorite of those shirts? Yeah, Ryan Giggs is one. Ryan Giggs as well. Was, I mean, I mean, it's, it was signed. Yeah, and, I suppose. You know, it's a team but the, shirt as well. which one? Which of those players? Which of any players? I suppose was the uh, uh, the best player you ever played against? Because I mean, it sounds like, from what you said about Thiago Silva in the video, it sounds like he was. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he I mean, was, he was a bit unstoppable. You look at the level he's played at in his career, and, and you know, it's, it's no surprise that he's the best player I've played against. Yeah, he's. It was. I mean, I remember you described that you just bounced off him, and that's yeah. that's pretty. That's a pretty ev evocative image, you know. Yeah, I remember going on on the pitch, and and I literally felt like a, a kid amongst giants, <laughs> and getting his shirt at the end of the game. We've had to do running after the game because yeah. you know the, the subs who haven't played that yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that much. And there wasn't any warm up kit because we, I think the women's team were playing after us. So oh, we've had right. to get changed quite quickly to, right, so right, right. they packed up all the kit. And so I've got Thiago Silver shirt because I've swapped shirts with him <laughs> and I haven't got a jumper or anything. So I, I put it on and it's drowned me. And I, <laughs> and I, I you know, you look at pictures of him wearing it and it's tight as anything. Yeah. And I just thought, well, He's, this he's, is a, he's, he's a big he's, guy. He's a big guy. That's funny because you don't look at him and think, yeah, that's a big guy. But no, he, no, no, he's, exactly. He's massive. That's interesting. But keeping it to players you play, well, players you played with, for example, obviously, um, who is better when you play with him? Just uh, bringing it to your under-21 days, uh, Ox, Axel Ed chamberlain or, or Raheem Sterling. Who, which one of those two was better when you play with them you know, at, at that level? At that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would have probably said Alex Chamberlain. Yeah. I mean... He, I mean, he. I think he was just ahead of Raheem was in a, in terms of just his understanding of the game and and his tactical knowledge right. and technically he's superb. I mean, yeah. Raheem was just he could do outrageous things. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'm not surprised to see him go on to 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 the level he's at now. I mean, yeah, he will go he will go further. I, I mean, believe. he's he's now basically he's England, probably England's best player. And yeah. I mean. Like you said, I mean, if he sharpens up his finishing, he could go even oh, become top. He's top, not doing top, too bad. Well, I know, but I mean, you know, there's that's the crazy thing about it is he's doing brilliant. Yeah. There's still room for improvement. And he's he could still be, very young as well. Oh, he's, yeah, I mean, he's he's. It's, what, what's it feel like to have played with players like that? Like, um, you know, to to watch them. Like, do you take a sort of uh, sense of pride? Like, I play with I play with those great players. You know, what I mean, and, and uh, you know, not I mean, not anything for me personally. Yeah. I'm just I'm just really happy for them. They're like, yeah. you know, a lot of the players I've played, you see how hard they work and and see how talented they are as well. And I, yeah. you know, I just think I'm just really pleased that, you know, they've they've become even more successful. You see Alex Chamberlain came off the back of a long term injury. I mean, yeah, that's his Won comeback. Is, league and yeah. you see Raheem Sun after a couple of years, he's had, like had not football wise. No, not football wise. No, he's had a, a lot of things. Yeah. You know, that that make up the industry that I've spoken about. And yeah. Have made it difficult for him, but he's really, you know, he's, 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 I think he's had a very strong backing from both Gareth Southgate and Pep Guardiola. Yeah, which, they've, you know, they they that's amazing, you know, for a player to have so much support, yeah, from the people who 
make their make the the biggest decisions in their career is so yeah. important and and you know he's clearly playing playing the back as well. Yeah. So I mean, you you mentioned managers there. Let's let's move on to to managers. Uh, you know, of, of, who is the best manager you ever played under in your career? Like, would you say? Well, if not the best, then the I'm, one who had the most impact. I on probably you. I didn't. I I'll, I'll give two answers. Okay. One manager I actually didn't play under, but yeah. was at Watford and gave me my pro contract. Actually, was Brendan Rodgers. Okay. And when he came into what you know Watford at the time were not the club they are today. Yeah. And, yeah. And you know we've heard about this manager who's coming from Chelsea reserves, and nobody knew really that, that much about him. And yeah. His methods and and training and and his coaching, his, his attention to detail is just incredible and the way he manages the players the manages people you know yeah yeah funny that in football managers are called managers because not all managers manage people and are, are good at managing people you yeah. know they're, they're either coaches or they're they pick teams or whatever yeah but he was very good at managing the people and the players and mm. and keeping everyone happy as well, which is a very difficult thing when you can only select 11 players. And yeah. for me as a young player to learn off the coach, he just had so much intelligence and knowledge and about the game was just great. Except when he gave me my pro contract, he, <laughs> I remember going into, into his office and pretty much for about 10 minutes, he sat there telling me the things I wasn't good at. <laughs> and then at the end he said, by the way, you're going to get your pro contract. Well, I, I genuinely thought, he, you know, he's he's just been grilling me for 10 minutes. I'm probably yeah, not going to get a contract. Well, I mean, that, that's one hell of a way to say, yeah. okay, now th there's your there's your bar. You yeah. get to us. Yeah. Beyond that, the, the coach yeah. the, and manager with the, that's had the biggest impact on my career by far is Sean Dyche. You know, he's, yeah. my, he's my youth team manager, my reserve manager, yeah. my first team manager at Watford. Yeah, yeah. And then as well at Burnley as well. So, yes, yeah, so I was going to ask about, about Sean Dyche. He's, 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 his image is obviously very much this larger than life uh, uh, character. Like, what's he actually like? Like, you know, I mean, you've, man you've been under him for so many different teams and everything. What's he actually like as a person, as, as, a, as a coach, one on one? In what perspective? Well, I mean, like, you know, um, not so much tactically, but what's he, is he, you know, how good is he? Like, is he more of a, is, you mentioned earlier coaches and managers. You know, yeah. is, is he more of a manager or is he more of a coach? Both. Is, I is both? Say, yeah. He's, I mean, he's very much a leader. Yeah. I think it probably stems from his playing days, but you know, you see the way his teams are set up. It's because of his coaching ability, but yeah. the way the effort that they put in is because of how he leads yeah. his teams. And so, you know, for me, it's no surprise how well he's done as a manager because he's been like that since you know I, I, he came in when I was what, sixteen. Wow. Yeah, so you so you've really I mean you've watched I mean as much as you've watched your yourself and other players have their career, you've watched his managerial rise, I suppose. Yeah, which has been amazing really. Do you think he could go higher than Burnley? Do you think he could yeah. manage a club a bigger club than I mean with all respects to Burnley, obviously. I mean yeah, you know, but he's made them into a Premier League club. But do you think he could manage uh, you know, a European level club, maybe even a top four top four yeah, club? I, I mean, mean you, you have to as well remember how young he is for a manager. That's you know, true, he's yeah. got you know, he's he's not been a manager for, for that long. And he's yeah. come a long way and been very, very successful, especially at Burnley. Yeah. And I think he can go on to manage one of the top clubs in the country, potentially even national team. You know, people will probably look at that and, and or hear that and laugh and think, you know, he's a long ball manager or something like that. What he does is he gets the best out of his players. Like, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, obviously Burnley don't Where have don't have. I mean, but I mean, Burnley don't usually have that many dribblers. But even then, look, you look at Dwight McNeil, who he's brought through, who's a very much a dribbling player. So yeah. obviously, there's a there's there's room to expand in, on his repertoire, yeah. which I mean, right now has been like I said, it's been long ball, but that's the players he's had. So that's so you re, so that's interesting. So Sean Dyche is much better than we than we than we proved. So that's good to know. That's yeah, he's he's because he's a nice character. Everyone loves him, but it's yeah. like you always want to know that you're not just sort of throwing your faith behind a, an image of a person. It's good no, to know no. that he actually is. I mean, is... I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of coaches and a lot yeah. of managers in the game and he's, you know, right up there you know, for his understanding, his wanting to develop um, his, his tactical knowledge, his yeah. leadership. You know, he he's, has a lot 
to offer as a, as a manager and obviously he's continuously developing I'm sure yeah all right so moving on to uh, uh to the crux of let's shirt talk right which is mental health in football now obviously I mean you you uh you retired this summer you know citing mental health and how's that how's that been for you how's retired life treating you I absolutely love it yeah I I I've often been asked if I regret making a decision or yeah. if I'm gonna change my mind and I I genuinely couldn't think of anything worse to think really? to go back and you know continue being a professional football player. Really? What, what's the what's the what's I mean see that this is obviously a silly question in a way, but what's the difference been for you for coming from the world of being a professional footballer suddenly to now being a normal person? I mean I was a normal person well, before. Yeah, then. you know what I mean. You know, not not basically not under the spotlight of being professional football, which all, all that's the funny thing is in all footballers, even ones like in the EFL, which isn't top tier, yeah. are subject to subject to this incredible scrutiny and gaze of, of yeah. I think social media's changed a, everything in football over the last you know four or five years. I'd say in particular, yeah. And I mean, there is a lot of pressure. You know, you, you think you people go out there and you know most players that, that are living their dream. You know, yeah. they go out there and they love what they do and and to them they, they want to enjoy it as well. But there's a lot of pressure of coming from people who, you know, look at the game as more than just, you know, what it actually is, which is it, a game. Yeah. And I think it's sometimes it's life and death and and Well there's the famous Bill Shankly quote, isn't it? Football is yeah. life and death, it's more important than even than even that, which yeah. Um, you know, I suppose is. Did you ever feel like it was a really a different sport, a different world, or did you feel like it was sort of they just so, they've sort of added so much pressure and sort of almost taken the fun out of a child of a child's game? Yeah, I mean that that happens to you know it's, it happened to me. It happens to a lot of players. I've spoken to so many players. Yeah, not just in recent months or years. Yeah. Like throughout my career, I've spoken to different players at different ages and different levels. Who have all said, you know, you get to a certain age and it becomes a job, which is sad, really, because most, like I said, most players go into the game and play football because it's their escape, it's what they love, it's what they're yeah. passionate about, and to have that passion kind of just hammered away and chipped away um, over years is is it's quite sad, but you know, it is the nature of the game, and people, players understand that that's how it is. Yeah, it's well, it's big business, isn't it? I suppose football yeah. now, so it's. Uh... It's, uh, but you know, I think campaigns like Let's Shirt Talk obviously are very important. And I think the tide, to a degree, the tide is changing almost. Like there was um, last season, sorry, two seasons ago, Andre Gomez, Barcelona player, when he, well, he was at Barcelona, now he's at Everton. He was obviously, he came out and he had an article, he pub, an interview published where he basically admitted that he had been struggling greatly mm-hmm. with mental health issues because of the pressures of playing for Barcelona. He couldn't handle the, mm-hmm. the pressure. And, and, uh, he was obviously much derided by Barcelona fans. He wasn't play, wasn't didn't play well for them. And then, but then the next game after the first game after the interview, he came off the bench and he was applauded by the whole stadium. And I mean, I think obviously that's one isolated incident and everything. But it, I do think it sort of signals a willingness to address the idea of mental health as not just something that oh yeah, mental health. It's just mm. uh, you know, but as something that is genuinely real in football in sport. Um, you know, and do you think we are get we are progressing in the right direction? And do you think there will become a time when people will realise, uh, like, or maybe think of, oh, that player's not playing well. Maybe he's struggling mentally. Maybe he's had, mm. maybe he's got a problem. Rather than just, oh, he's rubbish. You know, it's hard to say because of the way social media and and kind of the analysis of the game of football has come on so much. You know, yeah. it's every tiny detail. You, know, you talk about VAR and the players <laughs> offside by a millimeter, yeah, and every single little detail gets looked into for you know, hours and hours and hours. Yeah. But I think where football is has come in that's in you know the site in the space of mental health and yeah, I guess people more being aware of it, and more connecting to players on a human level. I think is because you know for quite some time players have been put on some pedestal for some reason that they're you know untouchable and they're they're objects they're not human beings and I think people warm to the fact that they as as see it's it's as sad as it is for players to struggle for mental health it gives other people in 
every other walk of life. It gives them something to relate to these people and, and see them as, as equal human beings, which as, they are. As is, normal people, yeah, as you said as earlier. People, yeah. I, mean, I suppose that's the, that's, I mean, it's, you know, you never, it's never good to anyone struggling with mental health, but I suppose the one thing is footballers being role models just by existing, <laughs> almost by the admitting that they suffer with, oh yeah, I have mental health problems mm. too. It becomes for, I mean, for kids especially, you know, kids, mm. kids growing up struggling with mental health issues and they say, oh, okay, so this is normal. Mm. You know, it's okay if you're sad. That's, you know, that's not, that's something that happens to everyone. Literally. And, um, but you mentioned social media there um, again, and it's, I made me think about, you know, it's, it's it's it can be a force for good but obviously recently what we've seen it mostly used for is a tool for people to vent racial abuse at black players i mean people are, black players of color but especially black players in particular in england obviously this is not racism is not a football problem it's a it's a societal, yeah. societal problem so it's difficult um it, it's harder but how, how do you develop a thought a sort of thicker skin to sort of not just get on with it obviously but like to be able to withstand um the abuse almost i would say it's it isn't it's beyond football it's it, it's you know it starts before football I yeah think. obviously yeah you know you're growing up in this world really yeah you know this world tends to be racist <laughs> at times yes yes obviously. and you know not just you know in your face and and just institutional racism that's that is ingrained in society and and these are things that most people's parents you know my mum just prepared me for yeah when i was younger i mean that's the problem isn't it it's that we often think of and i think the way that uh, uh racism is treated in football i've noticed of late it's a very much like oh these are bad actors we'll ban these guys because these fans are, are saying racial mm-hmm. and that's good you should ban people that say racial Definitely. things but at the same time it does seem to sort of obfuscate the actual problem which is that as you say institutional mm-hmm. racism societal racism the the subtle attitudes and stigmas that we allow to continue mm-hmm. that stereotype black players for instance uh yeah. the i mean you mentioned raheem sterling going back to the start and the way that he was spoken about yeah. consistently in the press was every single thing was was it, if it was not specifically objectively like saying this you know some racist yeah. thing it was very much dog whistle a lot of coded language that we know we, we know what you're saying yeah. you know what i mean and it's i mean is there a way for football to combat it effectively i mean beyond just saying hey people can you not do that you know i mean the bans are are one thing but like raheem sterling obviously uh some people have qu- have called for points deductions and stadium mm. bans. i mean do you think those penalties are too harsh or, or do you think that it has to be that harsh for people to actually it, get it the needs message? to be that harsh that's that's you know if 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 what's already happening isn't working yeah then it's not harsh enough really because yeah. people are still doing it now of course Many will say it's not a problem in it's not a football problem, it's a societal problem, which mm. is true. Yeah. But football has a responsibility because football is a part of society. Yeah. You can't just say, well, it's above us. Yeah. You know, because then nobody's gonna do anything, nobody's gonna get everything done because it's always above somebody. Yeah. If you as a part of something bigger collectively can play a play your part in changing something, then should. Yeah. So football should do what it can to to change society and be a part of the change in society yeah. it's not going to change society completely yeah but it can do its part well the, I mean, the poet musa okwonga has um he, he once said to me that uh sport can often it's it sport can't change society but it can show society the way almost like muhammad yeah. ali in the 60s yeah. uh what he sh- he didn't change anything and yeah lots of points stayed in bands uh would be would be a big deterrent i mean it would take time but i think it would it's, it's going to take time yeah i mean it's been, you know this is hundreds of years in the making literally so literally it's going to take it's, it's going to take time to reverse that to change that yeah but you have to start somewhere you yeah. can't expect things to change without actually making change that's that's a good way of putting it so just to just to put a tag on this obviously you directly i mean obviously i'm assuming you've suffered it there's been multiple instances of racism in, in, that you suffered throughout your career but most notably i think at bolton you really like dougie freeman came out and said you were really struggling with homesickness because of the abuse you faced did they really take your phone from you no <laughs> so that was that I, was I, just... I, I i don't know where that came from to be honest but no I, I thought i did i think he's a grown man that's a bit weird you can't do that yeah, yeah no okay well that makes a lot more sense but i mean, was it was it a struggle playing in Bolton away away from you know in, in away from 
where you grew up, obviously. Uh, in yeah, I mean, what I found most difficult was not playing. That was a bit, that was by far the biggest struggle, and, and you know there were a lot of things that happened around. I I mean I struggled with the move because I think it, it everything came very quickly, um, and I didn't have the time to settle. I, I had a lot of pressure placed upon me, and and which is something that I completely wasn't used to, you know, coming from Watford at the time and yeah. to go into a Premier League club, a, a, a very big club. Yeah. And there was a lot of expectation put on me very quickly and I was only 20 when I moved. Yeah. And, you know, moving literally overnight to somewhere you've you know, never been. Yeah, Bolton's a different world if you come from, if you come from <laughs> yeah. anywhere, anywhere, Watford or, or South. Watford, Bolton's a different world. What do you, I mean, was there any inkling then... The, the, I mean, because obviously Bolton have hit very big financial trouble of late. Was there any inkling then that they that, you had, that there was any idea that the club was spending beyond their means? Yeah. Or, or, yeah? I mean, we had a thing. Um, you know, I'm, I remember turning up for one of my first games. I drove to the car park and they had three people, I think, to park the players' cars. So you turn up, yeah. you'd... you'd stop your car yeah leave their en engine running you'd get out someone would park the car yeah. to about 20 feet away <laughs> and you did you, i you know I, I looked and i thought well, there, well, that, what that, is the point of that like, i can point. literally park my car myself because i do it every single day yeah that's and you know that that I, there, there would probably be a lot of things a lot of bottom fans would probably say me which is fair <laughs> you know it's fair enough um but there was a, a lot of money was probably wasted and on things like that let's go back to that night in serbia uh for england 21s when you won one nil but obviously uh horrendous infamous for the horrendous racial abuse you suffered i mean maybe a dumb question how obvious was it like was it was it as obvious as, it, as the players made it sound like it was just like unending yeah. racial abuse from the stands i mean it was when we went out to look at the pitch in our tracksuits before yeah. the game yeah there were quite a lot of fans in the stadium at that time and it was happening from then you know, monkey chance from that's probably what an hour and a half before kickoff. Yeah, that's yeah. So, and so it's from there to to the end you know, so, the game. So. You, can see, you can see why Danny Rose kind of lost it at the end, don't you? Yeah. I mean, it's understandable. Um, what was it? I mean, obviously, you know, you, know, you played sixty minutes, I think, in that night. Like that, yeah. uh, what, what what was? Did it affect your game? Do you think? I mean, having to or could could you have shaken off, or did it really just like? It it, it didn't affect really affect me. I kind mm -hmm. of you know when you're playing the game, yeah, you're very much like focusing. You're just yeah. on on the game, what's happening, and, yeah, yeah, and you you can't really hear and and you know see what's going on in the stands and things like that. And it's only there were only small moments when I you know really like kind of tuned out and heard it when I picked up a ball for a throw in or yeah, when you stop right when play, the ball goes dead you, yeah. which obviously you can imagine Danny Rose is taking a throw taking a lot of throw ins yeah he must so have. every time he goes to pick up the ball he's hearing it and, yeah. and you know it, like you said it just chips away it chips yeah. away it chips away and you just think why as a human being am I being looked at as inferior yeah did it? Did it ever? Did it sour you on wanting to play, wanting to represent your country, wanting to play for your country at no, all? Or no, did you just no, think? I mean, that didn't. That didn't sour me at all. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I see racism now differently to probably how I did when I was younger. Huh? I, I think it's just sad, really, that so many people are so close-minded, and they don't get to experience the world and how amazing the world is to its full capacity because they're so close-minded and, and ignorant in their ways yeah. to seeing how amazing so many different cultures are and you know it's just sad really yeah uh, to to close this off um obviously Gareth Southgate has voiced his support for the idea that if the players receive racial abuse again in now in 2019 that the players should be free to walk off the page should walk off the page do you support i mean do you support that do you support I, that idea? I think that's probably and what think? the nature the team should be doing yeah i think again i go back to the point of financially it affecting you know the the likes of uefa fifa you know if, if i mean tv broadcasts as well they're walking off the picture yeah, in a televised exactly. game so yeah, that's if a, if, a, if imagine you have england france um let's say portugal yeah uh brazil all saying they're not going to play in the World Cup. 
as an example. Yeah. That's that's a big problem for FIFA. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of that's and a lot of money. All of a sudden, people. yeah. That you know that's gonna that would completely change the game because they say actually we have to address this because without those nations the World Cup isn't the there, same. There is no World Cup, is it? Without the players, there is no yeah. game. Um, so, so we've looked back at your career and the uh, the, the things you've been through, things you've suffered, things you've done. Uh, what are you doing now? I mean, obviously, you know, you're you're, you're retired since uh, since the summer. So, what what are you up to these days? I own a production company, so video okay. production, which we just no, I, I we do a lot of different types of things, but yeah. the number one thing, you know, overall is that we just want to tell stories and engage in powerful ways. No, so I mean, you're obviously your production company put on the Let Shirt Talk campaign, yeah. so that was the first one. And that was an, I thought that was an effective campaign. So um, let's let's hope there's more to come from uh, yeah. from all of that. Marvin, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.